So you know that nightmare you have where it's a half hour until your talk and you decide to add like 10 more slides and then somebody phones you and says your talk is right now and you're missing it? That's the nightmare that I just had, so I, I apologize for being a little late. Um, this is kind of a weird talk and, and you are going to hit a couple of places where I've got these like great slides I was just about to throw in. Um, this, this is kind of a weird talk. Uh, I was invited very graciously by the organizers to come and give a talk to this community uh, and sort of there are various things that I was interested in talking about. Um, and I decided, maybe against my later better judgment, that the thing that is probably the most interesting that's happening right now is cryptocurrency. And I say that even though there are a huge boatload of interesting things that are happening as well. Uh, one of the other things that's happening right now is we're finally seeing deployed applied crypto that's actually making a difference. We're seeing TLS really take off. We are seeing a, a huge variety of different crypto attacks. Um, we're finding back doors in real systems, and these are all really, really interesting things. And yet, when you think about the change and the rate of deployment of new crypto, nothing really compares to what's happening in the field of cryptocurrency right now. So I wanted to give a very high-level kind of overview talk that goes back into the past and maybe looks at the future and talks about some, you know, some of the things that went wrong in the past and why it took until maybe 2008, 2009 to get to what we have today and, and what maybe we can do in the future. Okay, so uh, quickly, let me just give you my background. Probably a bunch of you don't know me. I'm, uh, I teach at Johns Hopkins and the work that I do is primarily applied crypto. So the work I do is really in kind of systems security, taking cryptographic protocols, building them, putting them together, and actually getting them out into real implementations. A lot of the work I've done is TLS. Uh, we looked at a lot of messaging system stuff, broke messaging systems. Um, but I would say the majority of the work that I've done since I was a grad student, where I did my thesis on oblivious transfer, is on privacy preserving protocols. I also have a blog, uh, which I try to write from time to time. Uh, somewhere in the last few years, I co-founded this weird cryptocurrency, which is called Zcash. Uh, which is really cool because it uses zero knowledge to um, actually give privacy. And that was a really weird experience um, all the way through. Um, talk about that another time. Okay, so, oh, this thing's not going to work on it, is it? Um, okay, no big deal. So why are we going to talk about cryptocurrency? What is so interesting about this? Well, there are, are a whole bunch of things happening that kind of affect us all. So one of the things that's happening is that we're losing the right to the word crypto. And, and, and we're losing this largely because, you know, unfortunately, crypto is so much more interesting when it has money attached to it. And most of the crypto we do, you know, we, we work on doesn't really have that. Um, so it's obviously affecting us in some very silly and obvious ways. Um, the other reason that, you know, this is so interesting to us, I guess, is that the amount of money and the amount of hype and the amount of interest in this field has really, really taken off. It's taken off to an absurd amount. In uh, December, I think Ethereum went up to $1,300, $1,400. It was insane, it's dropped back to only insane levels. But you know, things are happening and it's really kind of interesting, at least to the rest of the world. So whether you love it or you hate it, cryptocurrencies are kind of exerting this gravitational pull on our entire fields. Um, and that's in a good way and a bad way. So for most people, cryptocurrencies are their first major exposure to cryptography, that's great. Not really the most interesting crypto, but like anything that gets you in the door. Um, and it also lets us explore and deploy some really interesting novel crypto. I think uh, we've had more use of multi-party computation techniques in the last you know, few years than, than we had prior to that. We've had uh, more use of zero knowledge proofs and other kinds of things than we've had in the past. The kind of the bad news about this is that if you stare into cryptocurrency, it stares back at you and it can also kind of distort our research priorities sometimes in not very good ways. So this is kind of a problem. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, one of the things I want to talk about today is some history. So I want to go back in time to the 80s. I want to talk about payments and cryptocurrency. Um, I want to talk about some of this sort of practical stuff that's happening right now. I want to then uh, talk about some of the research directions a few people in this conference have been working on. And I'm going to cop to the fact that many of the problems that interest me are privacy related. And I've been told by people outside of this field that privacy is not the most interesting problem in cryptocurrency, and I don't believe them because I think it really is. Um, but you know, these things, these, there are other problems to be solved too. I'm going to focus a lot on privacy. And kind of the postscript to this, this all is that I'm also going to talk about some kind of random bad cryptography that I turned up, uh, came up across on uh, 
different cryptocurrencies, and that's not really part of this talk, but I thought it would be fun to sort of cover at the end. Okay, so I want to go back in time to the 1980s. Kind of the theme of this part of the talk is what went wrong. We started out with all of these dreams, and we got PayPal. How did that happen? Like, what exactly happened? Now, to sort of understand what happened with the payment system research of the 80s and maybe the 70s and so on, you have to start with the understanding that there was already a banking infrastructure. So banking was not a new problem. We already had plenty of systems that were basically databases that held account ledgers of different people's account balances and were updated in all sorts of pretty standard ways. So banking is not the problem. The problem that we started to tackle in the 80s was the specific problem of, I guess we could call them retail payments. Small individualized payments between customers and merchants or between customers and customers. And when we talk about this kind of this era of payment research, we're really talking about cryptographic payments. We're talking about payments that actually had some level of high assurance, maybe cryptographic security, and for better or for worse, a certain amount of privacy attached to them. There were a handful of problems that had to be tackled to make this stuff work. So first off, to build any kind of payment system, you have to tackle any kind of digital payment system, you have to tackle the problem of double spending. Double spending is a huge problem. So if you have anything that's a digital currency, maybe not a quantum currency, but if you have any kind of digital currency, of course coins can be duplicated. And that means that you can spend the same money twice. So we have to build systems that can capture double spending and prevent it, or maybe trace people who double spend and so on. If you're going to build a system and your reference point is cash, then you also need some kind of system that allows you to make sure that, that pays and other parties in the system have some kind of privacy so that you don't leak too much information during payments. And you have other questions like, how does money get into this system? You need a connection to the banking system in order to move money around. It probably the, the vast majority of the research we in the cryptographic community did in this area is into this field called eCash, which began with Chong back in 1982. Uh, the paper is actually cited as 1983. Um, and later with Chong, Fiat, and Noor. And these papers, I'm, I'm sure many of you have read the eCash literature, or at least have seen this very early uh, line signature based cash. Um, but basically, these eCash systems all had a very similar architecture. So they're a cash model with this kind of added privacy. And privacy was the new problem that people were trying to tackle in this research. So anybody who wanted to get money could get a redeemable token or a group of redeemable tokens. And ultimately, the problem that was being solved was detecting double spending in a situation where users had privacy. Okay, let's take a look quickly at the Chom 83, Crypto 83 paper. This is probably the simplest eCash system you could build. By the way, does anyone have a bottle of water? My mouth is getting really dry and this is going to be kind of awkward. Um, <clears throat> The Chom 83 scheme is the simplest thing you can build. Basically, in order to get some money out, the bank has a signing key. It signs blindly using an RSA blind signature, pulls down a serial number. The payer has that serial number. They can reveal that serial, serial number and the signature to the merchant. And ultimately, the merchant can then present that pair to the bank. And the bank can verify that the serial number hasn't appeared before again. So this is 1983. Okay, I want to fast forward to, 19, to 2005. And this is a scheme by Kamenesh, Hohenberg, Hohenberger, and Lysenskaya, which was published in Eurocrypt 05. Oh, thank you. You're the best. If you look at this scheme, it looks very familiar. It's ultimately got some much, much more powerful crypto in it, but it's the same scheme at a low level. Thank you. I thought you were the best. That's great. Thank you. Whoa, that's, that's a lot. Okay, the CHL scheme uses a key. Oh my God. This is, this is like December in Bitcoin. All right. Okay, the CHL scheme uses, uh, you know, it, it uses much more powerful technology. So down here, we have a PRF, so we can, we can pull out an entire wallet full of coins instead of just one coin. So instead of signing a, a serial number, we'll sign a key for a PRF. We'll compute the serial number using the PRF on some, some counter, and then we'll use a NISIC to make sure that you know, everything here is kosher. We'll give the resulting NISIC to the merchant. Okay, we, we do this, and it's much nicer and much more efficient, but it's really the same set. There's nothing new. And this is 20-something years in the future from John. So the things did not fundamentally change in the entire eCash field, and there was a lot 
of research done in the eCash field. So a huge number of work. I searched electronic cash on Google Scholar. I got 35,000 results. I don't know if those are actually 35,000 results, but there were a lot of papers done on this. And they come in variations. There were online, offline schemes. There were schemes that used trusted hardware. There were schemes that would reveal your identity if you double spent. But fundamentally, the main problem in all of these works was privacy, because privacy is kind of the, the problem to solve. The question we should ask, and this is you know, not the deepest question, but why did this eCash work not take off? Ultimately, in order to build an eCash system, and people try, uh, David Chom tried with DigiCash, you really needed to have two things. You needed to have a centralized bank, and that bank would be a single point of failure. If that bank went down, everything was gone. Your customers had nothing. And you needed some way to get money into your system, which typically was just another version of you need a bank. And it's very hard to get banks to uh, partner with you when what you're trying to do is build a privacy-preserving system that doesn't allow nation states and banks to trace you. In 94, EU regulations came out that basically said the only people who have the right to issue prepaid debit cards was, were banks. And that basically killed DigiCash because this, this meant that their entire business model couldn't work. Um, in, 9, in the US, 9-11 saw huge new laws that basically meant that anybody who was trying to operate a currency, whether it was you know, eCash or not, was, was actually shut down and many of these people had their doors kicked in. So this idea of centralized electronic cash, private or not, was really a non-starter. The question you should ask is, were these actually technical failures or were they just policy failures? And the answer to that question is kind of who cares? It doesn't really matter. They're indistinguishable. If you have a certain type of policy environment and the only technology that can work in that policy environment is something that you know, is not going to work there, then you have a technical failure. So you have this centralized problem, and ultimately we focused maybe too much on privacy, which scared regulators too much. Any solution we have is going to have to work around these manufactured problems. So to switch gears a little, I want to show you one other payment proposal that was uh, made in the 90s. And this one was much more conventional. It was developed by, by Visa and MasterCard. How many of you have heard of secure electronic transactions? OK, that's a surprisingly large number. I, I am amazed by that. This was a proposal that was developed by Visa and MasterCard, so really the, the people who are in the industry with access to the payment technology. And it was a pretty sophisticated cryptographic architecture based on credit cards um, using digital certificates. The idea was to get assurance, authenticity, and confidentiality for some things. Um, you have to love this kind of early 80s uh, clip art. The basic idea of the system was that there was going to be an online party and you, as the payee, was going to have a digital certificate that you got from somewhere. You were going to authenticate yourself using your certificate. You were going to go to this online party, and they were going to, going to then just authenticate to the merchant for you. And the key here was that you would never have to reveal your credit card information directly to the merchant, because merchants couldn't be trusted with this. We didn't have SSL working back then very well, and so this was kind of the solution to all that. And if you look at this, this is probably the biggest technical feature of that system. This is a, a little system that allows you to verify a transaction is authentically signed without knowing all of the inputs to the transaction, meaning that I could give this to a merchant without giving the credit card. And if you see, this is like the world's smallest Merkle tree, if you look at it on the side. So they were kind of anticipating Bitcoin at this point. Um, but this, this was kind of as sophisticated as it got. So two hash functions and, and you know, another hash function that would go into uh, some signature. Okay. Once again, why did SET fail, SET? So the obvious problem was it required users to get certificates, and nobody wants to get, we, don't, we still don't want to get certificates. Nobody wants to deal with, with key management and identity management. So you have to manage your own keys, plus you have to bind them to an identity, and you have to store them somewhere, and that is really unpleasant and very hard. So this idea of binding keys to identities is just not really workable. So what are our conclusions from this 1980s to 2007 time period? Well. All of the cryptographic solutions we had were too complex, or they were, had undesirable features like privacy. And I say undesirable with quotes, meaning that they were unworkable for the people who had to implement them. The commercial solutions, including SET, really didn't support a special case, which was person-to-person -person payments, which turns out a lot of people really want to do. Web browsers at the time, the kind of most advanced technology, did not support fancy crypto. And the end result was this little company called PayPal, which came up as a company that was um, starting out as a Palm Pilot to Palm Pilot payment system, 
came along and developed a system which was probably, and I'm gonna say this in a really nice way, but probably the dumbest possible solution you could get when you think about the different paths that we had available to us. And what I mean by dumb is not that the technology was dumb, it was very, very complex and hard to implement, but essentially what PayPal was, was a very expensive fraud layer built over the existing banking and credit card infrastructure. And the reason that was kind of annoying was how many of you have ever seen something like this on PayPal? Right? PayPal is legendary for not letting you make transactions, not letting you make payments or take your money. And the reason is that the only way they made this work was by putting a huge amount of fraud detection on top of things. Okay. So the good news from all of this is we got PayPal, but we also got Elon Musk. So now we have rockets and sort of that. And, um, you know, we got Peter Thiel, and that's fine too. So, um, you know, we had some good outputs or some outputs from this. All right, so moving on. In 2008, everything changed. I think this would be really the wrong audience to spend a lot of time talking about the details of Bitcoin. Um, but I think it deserves a slide or two just to sort of explain, you know, what was so fundamental about this development in 2008, 2009. Okay, so the main thing that the Nakamoto paper and the Nakamoto implementation did was it replaced this idea of a trusted server with a distributed ledger. You know, ledgers are, are complicated to build. Um, turns out you need some kind of consensus technique, and, it, and in this case, Nakamoto invented a new consensus technique, and that consensus technique was really new and unique and had some special properties, which I'll talk about in a second, that made this system work very well when it was standing up. There were some obvious things that came along. Uh, puzzles were introduced to handle consensus, to generate new funds. This was not a new idea, I think, um, Way Day and other people had, had thought of this before, but these ideas were kind of integrated. And one really, really fundamental invention was that, that Bitcoin eliminated the need to identify, to uh, bind keys and identities together in any meaningful way. You could just use your public keys and identity. Okay? When you consider these four major developments, and this is going to be like the worst summary that I've ever made. Everything else is really straightforward, right? It's all straightforward crypto. You use public key crypto to initiate payments. You use secret keys to sign and validate payments. Once you have a ledger that works, you can do this very simply. So everything else is really just engineering. So what are the lessons we can take from Bitcoin? Well, the first thing we can get is that picking the right consensus algorithm makes a huge amount of difference. And I think that we kind of underestimate how important the Nakamoto consensus was. I want to give a quote. Uh, I thought I saw Elaine here, but uh, this is from Elaine Xi and uh, Rafi Pass. This is from their paper they presented the other day, actually, in the blockchain session, which is that blockchain-style consensus achieves certain robustness properties in the presence of sporadic participation and node churn that none of the classical-style protocols do. This is sort of one of these anodyne academic statements, but it's really fundamental. If you're starting up a volunteer network, with nodes that are not reliable, that are peer-to-peer -peer nodes that are gonna go away constantly. You need a consensus mechanism that doesn't require setup, that is able to handle these cases. And even today, as we're deploying things like proof-of-stake protocols, we're still fighting with this problem. There are a number of protocols that are proposed to use things like verifiable secret sharing inside of a proof-of-stake protocol. Well, that requires that a bunch of nodes stick around for 10 minutes. Nodes don't stick around for 10 minutes. And this is something that, you know, unless you have a system that can actually achieve these guarantees, you don't have a workable consensus for this particular setting. Okay, obviously, the lesson of uh, we need to eliminate this key identity management thing because nobody wants to deal with identities. Obviously, that simplifies the problem. And then there's this kind of third lesson of Bitcoin, which I call the human beings are weird lesson. And this is going to seem this is going to seem like the most trivial. This is not a technical observation. This is probably the most trivial observation you can make. Um, here is the lesson that we seems very obvious in retrospect, but is not, was not obvious and would not have been obvious until you actually tried to deploy a cryptocurrency like this. Okay, so the thing that we learned in 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on, was that if you build a system that has tokens that have a guaranteed supply or a predictable supply that are secure in the sense that people have a high confidence that the entire system is not going to be shut down or the system is going to fail then weirdly enough, they're going to assign value to those tokens. It's, it's bizarre. We didn't know this was going to happen, and the fact that it happened actually has really big implications, probably bigger implications than anything I can say about technology or cryptocurrency. Now, the value that people pick for these, these tokens are you know, arbitrary. Maybe they're 10 times too high. Maybe they're 100 times too high. 
But the fact that they have non-zero value at all is really significant. And this is something that you can't figure out until you build it. And this is really the major observation, I think, from Bitcoin. Okay. So what were the limitations of Bitcoin? There are a lot of limitations. Now, I'm a little bit focused on privacy, so obviously the privacy limitations are what matters the most to me. Um, there were functionality limitations as well. Um, scalability and ultimately sustainability limitations for Bitcoin, which we're still sort of tackling. Um, the good news is we've solved the scalability limitations just by making like 150 new coins. So that's all taken care of now. Um, the serious news is that you know, there are a lot of different people taking different approaches. The, the first really huge limitation of Bitcoin was you know, the privacy limitation. This is a fairly old graph. Uh, you can tell it's old because that big red dot up there says Silk Road. But this is a map of the Bitcoin transaction graph as it stood back in 2013. This is a whole bunch of people buying drugs on a publicly available ledger and doing this in a way that's going to last forever. Now, they're doing this with pseudonyms, but they're not doing this with good pseudonyms because ultimately those pseudonyms are going to leak or they're going to be linked to exchanges and people's identities could be de-anonymized. So this system does not work particularly well. Now, when I show you this next slide, some of you may have seen this. This is a slide from an NSA program called Monkey Rocket. How many people have seen the Monkey Rocket slide? A really small number of people saw this. This is actually the result of a VPN system that the NSA set up in 2013, 2012. They set up a VPN overseas, and they allowed people to connect their Bitcoin nodes to it. And as a result of that, they saw huge amounts of Bitcoin traffic on the wire, not just on the blockchain. They were able to link IP addresses, not just IP addresses, I think it actually says MAC addresses, um, to, this, to this data. So they were actually able to de-anonymize a huge amount, of, maybe a large fraction of the blockchain, or at least the portions who went through this. So anonymity is very, very hard to keep if you were one of these unlucky people or maybe lucky people who went through this, this particular thing. Okay, so how do we address that? Well, two different uh, things that we worked on, or I worked on with a, a team of folks, and I see Ellie here too. We, we worked on uh, basically adding anonymity. I'm not going to go into the details of this. I worked on adding anonymity. Uh, two different uh, papers, one called Zero Coin, which used RSA accumulators and some zero knowledge proofs to fix this, and later uh, Zero Cash or Zcash, and actually deployed this. The reason I'm showing this is more as a warning. Now, I said that we're deploying a lot of crypto, and this is good. When my grad students and I wrote the first version of the zero cash implementation, we decided that we would write a library. We wrote this library, we put it up on GitHub, we added this warning. The warning says, for God's sake, don't use this in any kind of production currency. Don't put money into this terrible implementation that we banked out in a month over the summer. Now the reason that I'm showing you this is this warning, I copied it out of the Git repo for a coin called Zcoin, which is currently worth $500 million in terms of market cap. Not only did they take all of our code unchanged, but they actually copied the warning into their code. And so this, this kind of stuff, you can build things and they're gonna get deployed. And they're gonna get deployed in scary ways. It turns out we had a vulnerability in our code, which was that at one place where we had to check uh, the value of a field element, we forgot to specify that it had to be a field element. And as a result, you could double spend currency by computing, you know, a or A plus some prime P or A plus 2P and so on. So you can make big mistakes when you deploy things. So what other problems are there? Well, once you have a ledger, I mean the obvious problems that come up are you need some way to go from a ledger to, or go, go well, let me rephrase that. Once you have a ledger, you can do a lot of really interesting things. So if you think about a payment system as basically just a state transition where you have certain transactions that haven't been spent and you're going to some, you know, adding some new transactions that haven't Spend. The obvious next step is to make this entire thing into a generic evaluation of some function and make that function into something that updates the state on the ledger. So this really was where Ethereum came from, and this is kind of the, the general trending future of all of these cryptocurrencies, is we'll replace these very simple state update functions with complex ones. Um, and this is great. So now we have Ethereum. We can actually control the spending of money in very sophisticated ways. So now I want to talk a little bit about some problems that kind of interest me. And when I say this is the future, I don't mean this is all that's happening in the future. I mean, these are a few things that I think are kind of essential going forward with modern currencies. Okay, so the three problems that I think are the most interesting to me 
are how do we make blockchains and Bitcoin system, Bitcoin type currencies scale? Right? There are very limited uh, ways that we can do this. Uh, most people know that the current Bitcoin Ethereum transaction rate is about seven transactions per second. It's not very high. I think that seven may be, may be relatively high, in fact, compared to what it actually is in practice. If you compare this to Visa, and again, most of you know this, that, that, you know, the Visa system can top out during holidays at 40,000 transactions per second globally. So these are not comparable. We need some way to actually make these systems scale to uh, a reasonable uh, throughput. One of the ways that people have proposed to do this is they propose to do it using channels. Um, how many of you have heard of the Lightning Network? Okay, good. So the idea of a channel system is really, really, really very simple. The idea is that you have two parties and they want to interact, but they don't want to produce a lot of bandwidth on chain. So what they're going to do is they're going to establish what is basically an escrow. Don't worry about the details of how it's done. Let's just say they put some money in, each person puts in some money onto the blockchain. They have one transaction, that transaction can be later unlocked using a digital signature made by both parties, or if one party goes away, it can be unlocked maybe after a certain amount of time. The idea of channels is extremely simple. So let's say we have one party that puts in one Bitcoin, another one that puts in zero Bitcoin. Once they've done that on the blockchain, they can go ahead and they can interact directly to produce new signed transactions that change the balance of that, that, that particular channel. That's all they have to do. They can do that many, many times without ever going back to the blockchain. At a certain point, they, they decide they're going to close this channel. They can take the last transaction back to the chain, and they can cash out whatever each person's balance is. If there's a dispute, there's a mechanism to deal with the dispute. Not very complicated. The Lightning Network is actually up and running on a test net. This is a, a visual, uh, an explorer that basically shows you all of the different lightning nodes that are online nodes that are available to establish payment channels with. And the lines between them represent individual payment channel relationships that have been established on a blockchain. Let me zoom in on one of those. So this is a particular node, and you can see it has channels with other nodes, but also some of those nodes have channels with still further on nodes. So this allows us to send money, technically speaking, anywhere. But what are the problems with these networks? The first thing you have to see is that if we're just talking about a single hop payment channel, I'll go back one, there's really no privacy at all between the individuals who are, who are communicating. So if, if these two individuals have a payment channel open, they have to know each other's identities. They have to know every spend that the other person makes. If we go back to the Lightning Network, Lightning doesn't really have a solution for this because it's not privacy technology. What Lightning does is it says, if you want to achieve privacy so that you don't know who the two endpoints are on this, this channel, you have to place more intermediaries. So instead of a single channel, uh, the Elon will open up a channel with I1, I1 will open up a channel with I2, and so on, all the way over until we get to Peter. And the idea here is that as long as these parties in the middle are not colluding, hopefully Peter will not learn Elon's identity. Does this system work? Not so well. First of all, it requires that to get any privacy at all, we have to make extra hops, which nobody wants to do in any sort of system like this. We're not even sure there are going to be a series of channels that go from one person to the other, and we're not going to be sure that they have enough balance inside of them to make this work. But even if you accept that all of those things work, there is a really significant problem with the Lightning Protocol, which is that the transactions that people use to generate these things, to allow them to atomically close, have to share a value called a hash lock. And that means every single person in this channel is going to share a value H, and that value H basically binds together every node in the channel, which means that if I3 colludes with I1, even if I2 is honest, the channel can still be linked together de -anonymized. So it's not really onion routing, it's something much, much weaker. How do we fix this? Like, what's the fix for this channel problem? Because channels are supposedly the future of cryptocurrency. We're all going to be using channels to buy our coffee and pay our rent. We want some privacy. How do we fix this? One obvious idea is we could use Chami and eCash. We already have this technology. We spent 30 years building it. Let's deploy it in this setting. In the simplest one channel case, we can basically treat one party as the bank. We can establish some, some balance between the two parties. And now, whenever one party wants to spend money, Elon can, let's say, withdraw some currency uh, from David over here, and then spend it back anonymously back to David. We're assuming David has many channels open and doesn't know who's spending what money. So this seems like it's a pretty simple solution. What happens if we want to go to two hops? 
What if I don't have a direct channel to the person I want to pay? Is there a solution to this problem? Anyone? Come on, we're, not, we're never going to. I don't have a channel with Brent. I need some way to go to the bank. And maybe Brent does have a channel with the bank. There's got to be a simple solution to this. So it turns out that if you turn this around in a sort of strange way, you can make Chami and eCash work for two hops. And what I mean by this is we can elect David to be an intermediary, and David can basically act as a bank. Um, Elon can connect to David, withdraw cash, and exchange balances with, uh, with David. And Peter can do the same thing, where Peter initiates a connection to David in the middle. This is great, and if we have a system that allows us to exchange both positive and negative balances, now we have a way for one person to send money all the way through by sending, for example, positive one to David, and then David could send you know, positive one over to Peter. So this system works. Can it work for three hops? I don't think so. I don't actually see a way that you can go to longer number of numbers of hops in a system like this. It seems like Chami and eCash fundamentally breaks down when you try to go to longer channel lengths. And so this is because disparate channels have to be tied together in systems like this. There's no obvious way to make these work in a privacy-preserving way. So this is kind of a big open problem. If we're going to go to a world, a layer two world, where we're going to build channel networks between people, we have to find a way to build longer channels that have privacy, and none of the current techniques really seem to work very well for this. So another problem that interests me is this idea of replacing proofs of work. Uh, it interests me, but a lot of people are working on it and doing you know, kind, of, kind of neat work on this. So we all know that Bitcoin is consuming vast amounts of energy. I think the last I heard it was consuming as much electricity as Switzerland to compute the proofs of work that secure the network. We need to do something about it. There are people working on doing something about this. The most obvious solution to this is to replace the proof of work with something that is cryptographic in nature, where basically what we're doing is we have individual nodes with signing keys, and those signing keys can be used to sign blocks or establish consensus between different parties. How do we elect those nodes with the signing keys? Well, the proposal that's currently on the table is to use proof of stake, which is to say that people who have a lot of money will be trusted as the folks who can actually establish these uh, can actually sign blocks. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, the basic idea of all of these protocols is we first go through and we enumerate all the major stakeholders of the protocol. We make a list of them publicly, revealing their identities. And then we scale that list according to their stake, and then we sample from the list. Where do we get the randomness to sample from the list? We go to NIST. Do we go to random.com? I think that's actually one of the things I have in a later slide. Oh, no, but seriously, where, where do we get randomness from? In the Bitcoin network, or in any of these networks. I mean, this, is, this is kind of an open problem. So there are a handful of solutions to this. There's some really excellent work on this particular problem that's happening here at Eurocrypt. So uh, in the session the other day, there was a paper that actually dealt with a particular solution to this. Um, previous year, there was another one, uh, Orberos, which I can't pronounce at all, that tried to do this. And I believe some version of this is currently deployed in a real currency called Cardano right now. Okay, so the, the thing that's really fundamental about all of these systems is they require some kind of randomness to sample from. The original Ouroboros, I can't pronounce it, used an interactive protocol between potentially hundreds or thousands of nodes to establish these random coins that we would use for sampling. And the idea was we had a resilient protocol that could survive the loss of a certain number of people. But what happens if too many people go away? It's not really clear if this protocol is going to work. The latest version of the protocol deals with, uses a slightly different approach, and it uses a grinding resistant hash function, which is based on computational Diffie-Hellman. It's based on the idea that, yes, what we're going to do is we're going to have individuals provide input, which we're going to hash together to produce data, produce this apparently random beacon. But in these kind of protocols, somebody always has to go last. And that person can grind. They can use their hash power to sample many different inputs to find one that biases the output of the random coins. And so these solutions try to build hash functions that actually prevent people from grinding and actually trying to find biases that are useful to them under some relatively strong assumptions about what kind of things might be useful, how much of a bias we can actually live with. And the thing that's really interesting about this to me is it's the kind of result that you can prove on paper, and I think it's really interesting, but in order to see if it actually works, you need to deploy it experimentally. And so it's really exciting to me that cryptocurrencies are actually allowing us to do this kind of stuff. 
So the last area that I want to kind of talk about is, is being really interesting to me is let's turn this problem around. So, so far we've been talking about how cryptography can help with cryptocurrencies. But maybe cryptocurrencies, are you raising your hand? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was a first question there. Um, so maybe cryptocurrencies or blockchains can actually help us build cryptographic systems. So one of the things that people have been working on is, uh, including myself and some other folks as well, is let's imagine that we have these trustworthy devices. Do we have trustworthy devices? Well, okay, so maybe we have secure hardware that we trust to be somewhat secure, and there is this huge field that is gradually developing of building cryptographic obfuscation techniques, which in theory, hypothetically, some of them are hardware backed and some are pure software. Program obfuscation allows us to build hopefully trustworthy uh, devices or circuits that can perform certain types of computation. So let's assume we have one of these devices, but let's assume that it has no ability to keep state. And this is a very realistic assumption, particularly in the software program obfuscation world, because of course, software has no ability to keep state at all. Okay, so these devices, you know, we can build them inexpensively from hardware, we can, we can get them from wherever we want, and what we really want to do with these devices is compute multi-step interactive computations. Meaning I want to run a program on some input, get the output, and I want to do that, run that program again. Another setting where this happens all the time is imagine we have a network of trustworthy computing devices where we're performing a single multi-step program, but the program is run on a different device at each step. Is there a setting where that matters? Well, every smart contract system is already in that setting, as are a lot of serverless systems like Amazon Lambda, AWS Lambda, and other systems like that. So the idea that we have to synchronize state is not really, you know, uh, it's not a surprising idea. So how do we do it? Well, the obvious solution is imagine we have a secure computing device that has a key. I can always have a user send an input to that, that computing device. We can get an output as well as an encrypted version of whatever state needs to be kept by this program. And that's great. Next time I want to run the next input on the next step, I just pass in that encrypted state and I get an output as well as a new encrypted state. What's the problem here? <coughs> Good, it's trivial replay attack. If the device, has no, the device has no internal ability to keep state, I can always pass the third input along with one of the previous encrypted states and I can get that device to compute a new output for me. And I can continue doing this as many times as I want. If this is some sort of interactive cryptographic protocol that's being run by the device, I could potentially completely undermine the security of that protocol. So what can we do? Uh, let's imagine that what we have is something like a blockchain. So we have a publicly verifiable ledger. And publicly verifiable just means we can post a string to this ledger, we can get back something like a signature or some kind of verifiable proof that the string was posted. We can also just get a copy of the full ledger and we can send that in to the device. So given this, it's actually really simple to keep state. We can send our inputs to the ledger. We can get back the ledger contents and a proof. We can send those ledger contents onward into the device. And the device can then verify the ledger to see what step, it, step it's on and can send back an output as well as an encrypted state. And you know, go into more detail about this, you can basically build systems that are rewinding resistance simply by due to the fact that they are interacting with some kind of ledger. And this is really important in the smart contract setting where we're dealing with private contracts where we have kind of secure devices. So I think this is really interesting and I'm sort of curious to see what other things we can do, particularly in the setting of, of cryptographic obfuscation. Okay, I wanna talk, I wanna shift from research topics to a couple of, uh, this, this, this is the part that I said would be kind of unrelated to the talk, but a little bit more uh, amusing, hopefully. Um, I wanna talk about some of the worst failures in cryptocurrencies. Now one of the, hypotheses of us deploying all of this crypto is that we are deploying it in a setting where smart people are going to break it. Essentially, we're building the biggest bug bounty in the world. If somebody can find a flaw in our crypto, they can, they can come to us and they can actually tell us. They don't have to tell us anything. They just steal our money. Um, this is probably the most embarrassing one I found. Um, BitGrail, which is, a, a, I'm not even sure what BitGrail is. They lost $170 million worth of nano XRB tokens because they placed the balance checks for their system on the client side in JavaScript. Okay, so this is, this is probably the most embarrassing, most ridiculous one. Let me move on to one that's a little more subtle. Okay, so this is, um, I mentioned, you guys said NIST. You weren't totally wrong. Okay, so there is a, we 
website called random.org. Random.org produces, as you could imagine, produces verifiable randomness. Now, random.org on January 4th, and this was a few years back, switched to HTTPS from HTTP. And what this meant was that people who were calling random.org in order to get randomness were now getting in a 404 error. And it turns out when you serialize 404, it's not actually a very high entropy seed. <laughs> and for various reasons having to do with their implementation, they were trying to XOR this together with some other secure forms of randomness, and they didn't do that. They actually replaced it. And so every single wallet, uh, every single public key that came out of this started with 1B9RE, and a whole bunch of people lost a lot of money. So this is the kind of thing that happens in the cryptocurrency space. I want to just give you one more example along these lines. Uh, my favorite Ethereum bug bounty submission was a case where somebody implemented ECDSA, but they wanted to make ECDSA nonces more secure, so they XORed the message being signed into the nonce. Turns out that this produces a trivial uh, bias that allows you to pull out the private key and about 256 signatures, which a bunch of people then proceeded to do. So this was then you know, verified. And I want to kind of wrap up with my favorite <laughs> Cryptocurrency, IOTA. Okay, I'm going to skip past the part where IOTA invented their own hash function. I'm going to skip past the part where IOTA invented their hash function and invented their own artificial intelligence to invent their own hash function. I want to focus in on the IOTA signature. IOTA uses hash-based signatures. Nobody quite knows why, but these hash-based signatures are Winternet signatures. Winternet signatures have this really neat property that you start with a single secret key vector up at the top and you hash forward all the way down until you get the public key. And the idea is, let's say we're signing bytes. What I'm going to do is to sign any given byte, I'll start with a secret key and I'll hash forward a certain number of times. Let's say I'm signing the message three, I'll hash forward three times until I get to a secret key. And then I will output that hashed result as part of my signature and I'll move on to the next byte in the message. Well, one of the problems that crops up with these signatures is that obviously if I get a message that has a byte 3 as its first byte, anybody can hash forward to turn that byte into a 4. Just hash the message one time, hash the signature one time, and you change the message to a 4 and everything is fine. So this is actually a pretty easy signature to forge. And the fix for this is to implement a separate checksum, which you add on to the end of this, the message before you sign it. And the checksum has the property that you can't subtract Sorry, you can't increment any byte in the signed message without invalidating the checksum. I won't go into the details of how the checksum is calculated, but you can figure it, figure it out yourself. So it's really essential for the security of these signatures that the checksum work well. IOTA, the normal checksum, by the way, is an addition. Um, IOTA invented their own checksum. And the way they invented their own checksum, it does not seem like it actually guarantees that you can't increment messages. And as a result of that, um, oh, I should mention one thing. These signatures are also used to sign messages that come from a centralized party that operates their network. So if I have a message M, and you can come up with another message M1 that is greater at every byte position than M, then you should be able to hash forward until you get a valid signature on that, that message. It would be very unlikely you could find two such messages because they're, they're, they're the output of a hash function if they were long messages, if they were, let's say, the output of a full hash function. However, it turns out that IOTA only verifies one-third of the message, which turns out to be 27, oh, did I say that they use ternary? Yeah, they use ternary, so it's 27 trites, and so, which is equivalent of 20, 27 bytes. So this is not a terrifically secure signature. I'm not sure it's exploitable, but like, this is not a terribly secure signature. And I already mentioned kind of my, my most um, embarrassing example here, but I want to show you one last slide, which is that as a result of this hack, somebody went ahead and created 370,000 uh, Z coins out of thin air and sold them for several million dollars on exchanges. So these kind of things matter a lot. Okay, so, so my conclusion slide was the slide that I was fixing, so I won't show you that. What I want to really conclude with is that Cryptocurrencies, you know, this is sort of a fun talk, but cryptocurrencies are really serious. There's a lot of money out there, and a lot of people can get hurt if we don't do things right. But this also kind of gives us a unique opportunity to do really interesting new crypto. There are interesting problems out there. 
that we have not had the opportunity to solve. And we should be using our uh, kind of unique opportunity to solve those problems and, and actually deploy new ideas into this field. So thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions. Please go to the microphone if, uh, if you have a question. Hi, can you speak a little bit about the popularization of these technologies? Like, you spoke about the history and the problems that they're trying to solve, but how do they become popular? What makes them adopted by the general public? Uh, money, right? I mean, there's, there's, you know, there are two kinds of people, right? There are people who think this technology is amazing. I think the technology is amazing. I think it's super amazing to be able to send money to people instantly. But then there are other people who are excited about this just because they see it as a way to get rich. And that's kind of a drag. Like one of the things that will be really nice is when these currency values all drop back down to nothing, we can kind of go back to like just kind of playing around with the cool technology. And right now, we can't do that. There are too many people who are taking it too seriously. <laughs> oh, I mean, sorry, that's not good. Right? And 
There was a bug in IOTA just a few months ago where if your signature had the letter M in it, it would give you the secret key. <laughs> and my point is not that that was a particularly bad, well, that was a really bad bug, which they, whatever, but uh, my point is that that was in the code in a five billion dollar allegedly currency for at least months, maybe more than months. And so I think it's true that the great thing about Bitcoin is it is like the world's largest pen test, where you know the, it pays for itself. But I think we're also, we make a mistake when we deploy something and we say it hasn't been attacked yet, therefore it must work. And I, the reason that I get really nervous about that is new consensus algorithms, in particular, can work great for years until they stop working. And when your only real way to analyze them is to say, well, rational actors wouldn't attack this. Nobody's rational in this world. And so on top of that, you have this situation where eventually someone who's very irrational is going to do something to you and you won't really know. So I think people get very, very overconfident. Yeah, that's very reason. You talked a lot about uh, cryptocurrencies and the technology behind the main blockchain has also found another life now in the enterprise application world where it's called blockchain only with time pressure and so And in this context, I want to ask, what is your perspective on blockchains without coins? Can they be live? Uh, do they have the economic intrinsic values of this? So, I mean, there has to be some kind of payment to support for a permissionless blockchain where you have some people mining. You need some kind of payment to support that activity. I don't know how else you do it. For permission blockchains where you have individual nodes, uh, you know, you could just run a normal consensus algorithm. What's that? You need incentives. But like in private blockchains, they call them blockchains, they're not really you know, the same thing. Then you don't need incentives, and in that setting you can do some really interesting, nice things. And I think some people are going to deploy that. I don't know whether it makes sense in every application, but I think that is the case where you can deal without money.
Because right now, the best thing people have is to use Tor, and Tor's fine, but Tor's not optimized for this, because every time you make a connection to a Bitcoin network, you're using, you know, you're using a specific protocol that identifies you. So even if you do it over Tor, you're de-anonymizing yourself. So building something that can handle a specific case of broadcast flooding and do this in a very privacy-preserving way at the network level would be a really, really interesting project. And there are a few people who have done things like this, but you know, to actually build those kinds of systems would be really valuable. But for example, with Zcash, you know, if you want to do this mining, as an example of mining protocols, that, is, that doesn't seem to be a target that was important for the launch. So that means if you're a master node demonstrator, there is a master node demonstrator for most of the planet, and they're recording the launch of Zcash, they have a really good idea about everyone who's ever participated, everyone who's ever mined, and when it comes to shielding transactions, that's the one place they don't, in theory, uh, they don't have any insight. So is it the case that you would even want to use that over a network like Tor? Because I think you wouldn't. It's not end encrypted. It's just a TCP connection with your ID. Some people just switch and replace the ID. So is, is that a roadmark uh, or some, some sort of thing you're going to try to hit so you could even use it over anything in the network? I mean, definitely, yeah. Like, there, there's a lot of work to be done for Zcash and for all of these currencies in terms of engineering to make the actual network layer much more private. So absolutely, I, I don't claim that any of these problems are solved. Uh, the one thing I would say is that mining is really a different problem, right? If miners aren't private, if everybody knows who the miners are, well, that's not great. But it's also not the end of the world in the sense that if you mine currency, you sell your currency. If we can get privacy, at least from that point, I think that's you know a, a pretty decent solution. Obviously, it would be perfect if everybody was totally anonymous from the get-go. I mean, just having a would be useful. Yeah, I agree. Okay, if there's no more questions, and let us thank uh, Matthew again. Okay.